we can share it with whoever might be interested. So please just note that we are recording the session. Okay, so that's a little bit of housekeeping. And with that, let's get right into it. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Damilola Shobo Smith. I am the the coordinator of the IFC's Environmental and Social Risk Management Program. Um, I cover the, the West Africa region primarily focusing on Ghana. And um, I want to just share, take two, three minutes to share the ESRM program, um, what it's about with you. And, and, then, we can, and then we can move on to the, the real gist of the discussion today. So some of you, I know, I see very, very familiar names on the on the presentation already. So I think that um, a lot of you are already familiar with IFC's um, ESRM program for Ghana. But just for those that have, this is their first introduction to the program. The ESRM program is an advisory program that's targeted at at addressing or increasing the uptake of environmental and social best practices um, amongst um, financial intermediaries in sub-Saharan Africa. So in this case, in this case, this program focuses on Ghana and trying to support the banking sector in adopting what um, we are, what has been termed sustainable banking. So sustainable banking principles, which is integrating environmental and social considerations into how how um, how a business, how a financial institution does business. The program is supported with donor funding by the Swiss um, donor agency SECO. Um, they have been a very um, key supporter with IFC's ENS program, as well as the corporate governance program, which if you're not familiar with this program, you might be familiar with our corporate governance um, program. Both programs have been supported um, generously by the Swiss donors. Um, to talk about a little how we address this uptake of environmental and social best practices, there are four prongs or four components of our project um, that targets various or what we perceived or our baseline assessment of the different gaps in um, in adoption of sustainable banking in, in Ghana. The first really is a regulatory engagement. And here is where we realize that there is somewhat of a um, of um, a dissentive for some financial intermediaries to adopt best, um, best practices because of um, there's no there was no level playing field. So what we did was um, we engaged with the Bank of Ghana um, um, and developed regulatory frameworks that, um, that can guide the financial um, sector in Ghana, primarily, first of all, focusing on the banks in Ghana on how to integrate or how to adopt environmental and social best practices. And then this was very key because one of the things we were hearing from the different um, financial intermediaries that IFC was working with in, in Ghana and in the, in the sub-region was that um, requirements around environmental and social best practices were always put, were putting the banks at a disadvantage somewhat. So um, the banks are asking their clients certain questions or asking them to do better or comply better. And then the clients were feeling a little bit of pressure and then going over to the next bank uh, because they didn't feel that that bank was being competitive. So with the launch of the Ghana Sustainable Banking Principles in November 2019, there really now is a level playing field for all banks to be adopting and integrating environmental and social best practices into how they do their business. And we've anchored the conversations, the ESRM webinar series, Let's Talk Sustainable Banking, around these principles because we want to, alongside um, the great work that the Sustainable Banking Committee is doing, start to have conversations amongst practitioners, amongst financial sectors around what is and how do we get from where we are to, to the goal or the vision of the sustainable banking principles. The second level of engagement in the ESRM program is a market level engagement. And here we identified that there was a gap in capacity to serve the banks or to serve the financial intermediaries that want to do better or integrate ENS best practices into how they do their business. So here we identified local consultants and local training partners and developed training curriculum so that they can, as the demand for sustainable banking, sustainable banking initiatives starts to increase, there is that um, supply of, of capacity to support. Um, and um, the third is the awareness raising. And so here it's very cross-cutting, trying to target different stakeholders in the financial sector and starting to talk about what is sustainable banking, what are the best practices, 
what are industry um, um, best practices around environmental and social issues. And then final, finally, a sector level engagement that, that um, focuses on working with um, um, select FIs, financial intermediaries, to diagnose what are you doing with your ANS systems and where can you be? So that's a quick overview of the ESRM program. And without further ado, let me um, do a quick introduction to the moderator for today's session. So today's session is being anchored and moderated by Dr. Vera Fiado, who is a principal consultant um, with Madielo Consult, as well as being a senior lecturer and researcher with the University of Ghana um, Business School. Um, Dr. Vera has extensive experience with um, in business management and finance, and she's focused primarily on corporate governance, um, corporate finance, environmental and social risk management, amongst others. So she's the perfect um, um, person to anchor today's conversations. Um, she's also a member of the African Economic Research Consortium and a visiting um, um, scholar at the IMF. So Dr. Vera is one of the consultants that we've trained. Remember when I talked about the two the, the different um, trainings, the training of consultants to support the banking sector. So Dr. Vera is also um, one of the consultants that we've trained. And so throughout this, throughout the, the seminar series, we're going to be featuring or um, getting our IFC ESRM consultants to lead and engage on the various conversations. Um, Dr. Vera is going to do most of the talking. So you're probably not going to see me after this, which is fine, trust me. I don't know anything. <laughs> um, but she's also going to be joined by um, some very ex um, experienced people. I think between our two, um, our two other um, um, panel discussants, we have over 60 years of experience. That's a lot of experience. So um, permit me to welcome and introduce uh, Ms. Abena um, Brown, who is from the National Banking College. So she joined the National Banking College in 2016 and is the principal and member of the governing um, Council of the National Banking College. She has over 32 years of experience. So I'm definitely listening and taking my, my, my pen to, to take notes. She has a lot of experience in accounting, finance, technology, learning and, pe and people and transformation strategies across the continent. Um, prior to, to NBC, she worked with Standard Chartered for over 14 years in numerous capacities as people team lead for West Africa Shared Services. She's also a founding member of the Committee for Cooperation Between Law Enforce Enforcement Agencies and Banking Communities and serves on, the, on various boards, including the Ghana Central, Central Tender Board um, and the Ghana Amalmitted Trust. And she's a member of the Institute of Directors, Ghana and Executive Women's Network and Association of Talent uh, Development. So there's a lot of experience there. So welcome to uh, Ms. Brown. Also, we have one of my colleagues joining the call, um, Mohamed Wuri, who is a corporate governance specialist in IFC. He supports um, the West Africa corporate governance program and works in the sub-region. Um, so he has extensive experience in Africa. Um, part of his role includes providing support to private sector firms and institutions in enhancing their corporate governance uh, practices. Um, Mohamed has extensive experience in financial services, business development, project management, private sector development, corporate governance, marketing, and communications. And he received his um, MSc in international business from Henley Business College. So um, welcome again to everyone. I am very excited to be here and to learn. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to keep quiet and pass it over to Dr. Vera to, to take over. Uh, Dr. Vera, please take over. I think you should be able to share your screen now. Please let me know if you have any issues sharing your screen.
Now. Yes, please go All ahead. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Can you see my screen? Okay. All right. Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. So today we are talking about sustainable banking. We are talking about sustainable banking and then um, the principle of corporate, uh, the principle three that relates to corporate governance. Now, by way of uh, introduction, my name is Vera, as Demi earlier indicated, and she's already um, introduced me, so there's no need to go over this. So we delve right in. So the issue of sustainable banking has uh, become um, very relevant in recent times, even as we all gravitate towards what we refer to as sustainable development, meaning that we are seeking to develop without um, having an expense for the future generation to pay up. So in essence, we incorporate sustainability into the way we do things. So when we talk about sustainable banking, here we are trying to integrate environmental, social, and governance criteria into what we know as our traditional banking, which is the typical deposit taking and learning. And in the process, therefore, we move away from just looking at profits and then we are setting ESG benefits also as a key objective. Now, when we talk about sustainable banking, literally it implies that we are trying to carry out banking but with a conscious effort so it's not a byproduct of you trying to just be good but it's a conscious effort to consider the environment and social impacts of these activities of banking be they direct or indirect and of course when the integration is taking place it's not just for the bank trying to integrate environmental social and governance practices into their activities but they are also supposed to extend that in relation to the external uh, clients. Now, what that means is that as we gravitate towards sustainability, these are the mandates for the environmental, social, and governance pillars. So for the environmental pillars, we are looking at sustainable natural resource management, biodiversity con conservation, pollution prevention and abatement, clean renewable energy innovations. 
And then on the social dimension, we are looking at labor and working conditions being up, supply chain management, community health, safety, and security. And then looking at indigenous people and cultural heritage. So that's for the social dimension. On the governance frame, which we've had in recent times in the banking space, et cetera, we are looking at ethical stakeholder relations, effective structures, fair processes in our dealings, compliance, transparency, accountability, and corporate citizenship. Now, when we move to that, it means that when a bank seeks to integrate sustainability into the way it does its things as well as how it relates to clients and by incorporating that in terms of its funding decisions who the kind of products they bring out in totality the banks can be very influential in supporting the drive towards environmentally and socially responsible projects now that's because within the african landscape and particularly in ghana banks dominate the financial intermediary space, meaning that for a lot of businesses that need funding to grow and expand, they rely on the banks. So when the banks become the anchorage points at which we're trying to push sustainability, it means that you don't get funding unless you apply these ESG principles and the way you do things. And that for the bank in general, and for everybody who gets involved, the benefits include improved brand value, you get long-term reduction in costs and you're able to grow revenue because these things always come out uh, in a loop. Now, when we go on, we now look at sustainable banking principles in general. When we talk of sustainable banking principles, we are looking at banking that is characterized by at least these seven principles as enshrined within the Ghana sustainable banking principles. So here we have the first one that means that as much as possible, a bank is supposed to identify, measure, and mitigate, as well as monitoring environmental and social risks and business opportunities in its business activity. So that's more to do with the external relations, so its clients, et cetera. Now, the bank must, under principle two, now the bank begins to incorporate or internalize ESG or in this case, the environmental and social governance practices in its internal processes. So within the bank in and of itself, principle two requires that ESG be taken seriously. Then we even expand more on the issue of corporate governance in and of itself and the pursuit of ethical standards. So for sustainable banking to roll out or play out fully in Ghana, good corporate governance must also be very prominent. Then we have principle four that seeks to promote gender equality. Now that's because on the average, half, almost half of the world's population is female. So the issue of getting appropriate development is, is premised on the fact that you need to incorporate the various divides that make up the world's population is only then that you're able to promote development that is sustainable so development that does not necessarily take away from another and also encapsulates the relevant issues for both genders is relevant then we have principle five that looks at financial inclusion now financial inclusion is known to be um, a premise for economic growth because when socially excluded entities are finally included in the financial services sector they're able to grow and expand. And this translates into poverty reduction among others. And once poverty is reduced and businesses begin to grow by virtue of financial inclusion, banking has more business to continue. And then we have the principle six, which focuses on resource efficiency, to promote resource efficiency. So as much as possible, sustainable banking is supposed to be characterized by the promotion of resource efficiency and sustainable consumption and production. And then on principle seven, there's a need to report on all these and also seek to improve on performance over time. Now, our focus for today is on principle three, and that is on corporate governance and ethical standards. Now, when we talk of principle three, its main drive is that it seeks to encourage following good corporate governance practices within the banking institution, and that the banks will ultimately want to refrain from doing business with 
entities that engage in unethical behavior or practices. Now, when you stretch this, what it means, like I said earlier, is the fact that failure to comply by good corporate governance means that funding may be a challenge. And we already know that SMEs do have a challenge already. So failure to comply by appropriate governance means that funding is going to be an even bigger challenge for those that do not comply. So what it means also is that you have to, as an SME, as a bank, in totality, we seek to develop corporate governance policies and procedures that pursue both local and international best practices. So of course, these are some of the, of course, this is what is just captured within the sustainable banking principles, the following good governance practices, and the fact that the principle applies to both banks' internal business and their dealings with their clients. So that is for now. When we talk of good corporate governance, then of course the issue has to start with what is corporate governance before we get to the point of identifying what is good. Now, when we identify what is good, then we can say that how close you are to good. So corporate governance in and of itself, it's more of a, a protection or a control mechanism. Normally this happens when there's a separation between ownership and management. So you can see from the diagram here that they are shareholders. They usually provide capital for managers, the CEOs, et cetera, to run their businesses. And then in order to ensure that an agency problem does not arise, where this will pursue things that are not in favor of the shareholders, the board, which is a corporate governance mechanism, the board is appointed. So typically, the board then, by virtue of its governance rules, will set the desired goals for the organization, mostly the long and term and strategic direction of the organization, and see to it that the right things are done. So corporate governance will refer to the structures and processes for the direction of on control of companies. So that's how the corporate governance framework actually comes into being. It's more of a control mechanism to see to it that the interests of shareholders generally are pursued. Now for the board, which is standing instead for shareholders, and we'll later find out that um, the bank plans, they have an oversight and control function as well as strategic guidance. Under the oversight and control, they are typically responsible for reviewing and approving companies' financial standards, policies, and plans. Their job also has to do with election and dismissal of senior management, that is when they do not perform. They also see to it that succession planning is, is properly provided in the case of senior management and relevant positions. And then they are supposed to be reviewing results over time, looking at corporate philosophy, the goals and competition, and also more of appraise or even assess senior management. And then the board itself is supposed to approve its performance on or appraise its performance on an annual basis and take steps to improve performance. In terms of the strategic direction, they help to ensure that manpower and is equal to the organizational requirements that the firm has. They also work in approving corporate philosophy, looking at the firm's long-term spending and approving their long-term goals. So overall, they oversee and control and also provide corporate or strategic guidance for any organization. Doctor, so, Doctor that Barra, so sorry to interrupt. I think we have people in the waiting room um, I don't I, I don't have control over it anymore, oh, okay. but I, I have people sending me messages that they're waiting. All right, let, let me make sure. Sorry, how that happened again? Uh, I'm making me a host. So. Okay, thanks. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So then we have a case. So when we want to look at corporate governance, and we want to apply the IFC governance uh, methodology. In essence, for a board of directors to literally be captured as being relatively fit and proper, 
it must show certain characteristics or it must be defined by certain characteristics. So the board of directors, or in this case, the board must have commitments to corporate governance, meaning that the board must be committed. So there's a need to be assessing the overall level of commitment to and formalization of governance within the organization. So that's part of the things that should define a good board or good corporate governance. There must be board effectiveness. So as we work towards good corporate governance, there's a need to assess the board's role, the composition, committee structures, procedures to ensure that there is effectiveness. Effectiveness means that whatever goals there are, are being achieved. Now, an effective board will also be characterized by an appropriate control environment and sets of processes. So there's a need to also assess the overall effectiveness of relevant internal controls, risk management, internal audits, external audit compliance. And that is one of the things that also quite uh, characterizes an effective board or a good corporate governance mechanism. Then we also have shareholder and stakeholder relations. Like I mentioned earlier, yes, the providers of capital are the shareholders, but then in totality, there are other stakeholders which we'll look at in full. So now there's a need for corporate governance to always ensure that the relevant shareholders and stakeholder relations are taken and complied with seriously. So related party policies, et cetera, conflict of interest. And then in the case where there are family entities at play, there's a need to assess their role in the business and the mechanisms used to govern those relationships. And then last but not least, but also quite very important is the need for disclosure and transparency. So there's always a need to ensure that there's transparent information in relation to the activities of the organization and the board in general. Now, when we talk of corporate governance and sustainability, it ties in with the issue of stakeholder engagement and management. Now, a typical business, be it a bank or an SME or any business whatsoever, actually employs resources that span beyond the capital provided by shareholders. So you've got the case of you've got employees, you've got the media, you've got regulators, the entire environment. So corporate governance here sees to it that as much as possible, you balance the stakeholders, the expectations of these stakeholders, because sometimes these stakeholder expectations can actually conflict. So good corporate governance ensures the right balance, seeing to it that none gets their benefits at the expense of the other. And that is, in a sense, how corporate governance contributes to sustainability. Because um, a firm that continually fails to address the needs of certain stakeholders is setting up for conflict, for issues, reputational risk, legal issues, et cetera. And so those are some of the ways in which corporate governance contributes to sustainability. Now, in terms of the principles that underlay corporate governance, when you put it all together, you're looking at the fact that you can use the acronym RAFT. So there's provision for responsibility, accountability, fairness, and transparency. So you can see that it comes back full circle to realize the fact that as much as possible, the principles underlying the corporate governance uh, of an institution should recognize the legal rights of all relevant stakeholders. And as much as possible, encourage cooperation between these stakeholders to create wealth, jobs, and sustainability in the long run. In terms of accountability, corporate governance is to it that management is accountable to the board. And then the board is also accountable to the relevant stakeholders, shareholders included. There should always be fairness. So corporate governance pursues fairness, protecting the relevant shareholders and stakeholders and their rights, treating all relevant stakeholders, including minorities with equity, and then providing effective redress where there are violations in terms of fairness provisions. And then there's also the need for transparency. So good corporate governance is characterized by a transparent framework to ensure that there's always timely and accurate disclosure of information. Now this has to do with material information, including financial situation, performance, ownership, and even the governance frames that it operates within. Now, 
So having said all these, the question to ask is, is that really a business case for corporate governance? Because it appears non-financial enough. Everything we've mentioned so far appears to be non-financial. So the question is, does it really make a business sense to pursue corporate governance? Now, there are a number of studies, and quite a number of them, which have shown that, yes, corporate governance does make for a good business case because it actually improves operational performance. And so a lot of firms with um, good corporate governance usually raise much better than their peers in terms of economic value added. So that's the EVA. And then they are also able to, they are characterized by improved risk management. And then of course, there's also higher firm valuation and share performance because investors and shareholders perceive that as providing good value. And because corporate governance provides assurance that there are appropriate control measures to see to it that capital is put to the right use for the benefits of shareholders and other stakeholders, there's a strong correlation between good governance and lower cost to capital because the perceived risk also drop. And in, it also helps to improve sustainability. Now, on this other side, we see data from some studies that show that truly when it comes to raising capital and especially for those that may have to issue shares investors are willing to actually pay a premium when there's strong corporate governance meaning that by setting up a strong corporate governance framework within your entity aside from reducing access to capital and even improving the access in and of itself entities are ready to pay more for a firm that is characterized by good governance. And the studies that have done so far, capturing Indonesia, China, through the US and the EU, show that investors are willing to pay on average 20% more than the going price if the firm is characterized with strong corporate governance. And then this is to confirm the fact that truly firms with good corporate governance normally outperform their peers. And then, so we find that weaker firms usually have weaker corporate governance and then stronger firms have stronger corporate governance. So then the question then is, how does one get good corporate governance running? It starts with the basic fundamentals of when does they need to set up the board. Setting up an effective board therefore requires a full understanding of the board's role and director duties, which we'll discuss in full later. And then the need to actually, so there are times when yes, there's a good board in terms of, there's a board in terms of on paper, but when you narrow down to the nitty gritties, there are a number of issues, related party issues, conflicts of interest, uh, lack of the, a full understanding of some of the job roles. So you have boards that sometimes are too old, are not that diverse in terms of skill sets, have related issues. And then they have not necessarily evolved to meet with the times. Then we have another board here where you can see that the board is laden with conflicts of interest. Some are not even fully um, in consonance with what the board is pursuing. So there's this conflict, conflict of interest, lack of understanding of what they are supposed to be there to do on the board and lack of um, a clear idea as to how they're supposed to contribute to the value creation process that is the board is mandated to pursue. So the question then also becomes if you begin to look at yourself as an institution, as a bank, what type of board do you have? Is it a board with low involvement, usually ranging from a very passive board or to the operating board that makes most of the decisions and management just implements? The issue is finding the right balance. And that means usually the engaged board being there in the middle. Okay. So there's a need. So sometimes there's a bit of a conflict or not so clear line between what the board is supposed to do and what management is responsible for. Now, strictly speaking, the board is responsible for the strategic direction 
and more of the approval and then organizing the board and monitoring and guiding managerial performance. Management, on the other hand, is supposed to come up with the ideas for the approval, develop the relevant business plans and budgets for approval, come up with an effective executive team, which will ultimately be um, evaluated or monitored and assessed by the board, and then will carry out all other corporate activities to achieve corporate strategy and business plans. So for a typical board, the idea is to have enough information to smell and direct the path, but then hands out in terms of having a day-to-day -day influence on the operations. Now, getting the governance fundamentals right also means that the board must be composed accordingly if they are to perform their functions. Getting that mix of skills means that there would be a mix of executive, non-executive, and independents. There should be relevant industry, and there should be a geographical market experience. In terms of the subject matter experts, there's a need to have all the relevant areas, understanding of finance, risk, legal, and others that are relevant to the pursuit of organizational goals. And then you should have a blend of leaders and tacticians in there. In terms of diversity, which is also a very important aspect because diversity of a board also takes away from the group thing. There's a need to look at age, gender, and cultural diversity. And then there's supposed to be risk adversity, differing perspectives, and in terms of other value added, business contacts and reputation. So we have a case of beyond having the general board, there's a need to set up an effective board committee. Now, while this is not a fully um, exhaustive list, there's a need to consider having an audit committee. Usually it's most important because they take you to the audit function and the control settings within the organization. There may be a nominations and remunerations committee. There's a need to also look at risk committee. This is really critical for financial institutions. And then they can have the executive committee, strategy committee, and other ad hoc committees as the case may be. So depending on the institution at hand, and in this case for the financial services sector, a number of these sample committees may need to be looked at. And also for the Banking clients, in terms of the SMEs and the average companies that seek funding, these are things that the firm should begin to look at if they want to up their chances of getting funding from the banks. So as we go on to end our session, one thing is clear, having a good corporate governance framework is key. But as we may have experienced from what happened within the financial services sector, we could actually have a good board in terms of the paper, but questions you need to ask yourself. Does your board question intelligently? Does it debate constructively? Does it challenge rigorously? And does it decide impartially? These are the questions I leave you with, even as you may be an SME, a financial institution, um, an entrepreneur thinking of setting up an institution. These are the things you may want to go on with. And that brings me to the end of my presentation for this as we move on into the panel discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Vera. Um, I just want to maybe press pause and ask if there are any questions or comments um before we get into the before we get into the um the second discussion se uh, session so if you have any questions or comments please feel free to drop them in the box in the chat box or raise your hand and then i'll i'll see you and then i'll unmute you or or you can unmute yourself um and for the questions around will you get this presentation yes you will get the presentation um we'll share that with you after the session is over so please, if you have any questions or if you have any comments, 
um, let us know now. Otherwise, we'll start to set up for the next um, part of the of the of the webinar. Okay, so no no questions just yet, Dr. Vera. So please go ahead. Um, So, joining me for um, a bit of discussion on the corporate governance issues will be Mohammed and Ms. Brown from NBC. And it's, it's going to be more of a, you know, thought sharing and ideas here and there on the relevance of corporate governance, both for the financial institution and as a client of a financial institution as the banks or as the sustainable banking principles are being rolled out and given that the banking sector is the most powerful lender within our frame, the next question you need to ask yourself as a business entity, whether you are ready for sustainable banking, how ready are you for sustainable banking to roll out? Because when it rolls out, are you going to be affected positively or are you going to be affected negatively? So these are some of the issues we want to Thank you. So my first um, point will be to ask um, my panelists to make a comment or two based on what I may have presented, what I presented, and if the uh, other things they may want to add before we deliberate or we delve into any kind of, um, should I say, question and answers or discussion on issues. So. I know that the banking college per the fit and proper uh, mandate given by the Bank of Ghana has rolled out a corporate governance uh, program for banks. And I believe that in the long run, other institutions may be able to benefit. So maybe Ms. Kasua Brown would want to give us a sense of why this, why now, and any other thing she wants to add. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fiador. This was a brilliant presentation. Uh, and um, so just a, a, a couple of comments. The first one would be uh, on the benefits and the business case. Uh, and the, my concern uh, currently is uh, the awareness of whether the institu institutions um, being in the African sector where, where we environment where uh, we may poverty is you know challenged in, in this uh, area businesses are challenged the, and the question comes uh, that when we look at African industries are we going to be able to appreciate the the benefits of good corporate governance. That's one of the things I wanted to ask in, in the sense where now, if you look at the Asia, you look at US, you know, companies will stop, people will stop dealing with you if they know that you are not practicing good corporate governance. When will we see that reflecting in Africa? When will we see that reflecting in Africa where people will, uh, take the uh, benefits of the corporate governance principles uh, very seriously to impact the, their businesses. And this is, uh, I, I come from this point of view because it's not that people are lacking information. They know that it is good, but then there's the other side. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Okay, I think that's a very deep question you've asked in there. And uh, yes, um, I believe the awareness is being, uh, I believe IFC is doing a good job of that. Once the awareness is created, I believe that dividends will begin to show because with the awareness will come adoption and then the adoption will mean that if you're not, so now, um, I mean, um, IFC, I believe, will continue to do well, and then other institutions will follow through and help with that to ensure that as much as possible, people begin to understand and imbibe 
the principles of corporate governance. And so if it's a group think and we are all working towards uh, appropriate governance mechanisms, anybody who falls by the wayside is not kept as part of the group. I think we will get there. Um, at least it started with the sustainable banking principles. Now they are consultants in and around IFC has trained for a few, myself included, to help with the rollouts. And I believe that is going to pave the way. And, and I think that's, that is just the way to go. Um, Mohammed, would you want to add anything? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Vera. And um, Mr. Brown, thank you very much. I mean, the very insightful um, presentation. And you covered, uh, you know, quite a bit in depth there. And uh, indeed, uh, I believe uh, from what the, um, Ms. Brown said there in terms of the, you know, is Africa ready or appreciates corporate governance? So what we've seen in the, you know, in our work is that it's a progression um, essentially where, uh, you know, companies feel that they have to, be, or businesses feel they have to be big in order to start implementing corporate governance, you know, but what we at IFC are doing now is even just going to SMEs, you know, because uh, we believe that having a good foundation, uh, you know, the earlier you start implementing these practices that, you know, the better it would be for your sustainability because it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, if you look talking about ethical practices, um, you know, transparency, disclosure, these are things that have to be built in within the culture of an organization. So indeed, uh, what we have been working on IFC is trying to see how we can get businesses thinking on that level from the onset and, and also try to get more of, uh, you know, the stories out there, because I believe in comparison to Western countries where we uh, face the challenges, not telling our stories, you know, in terms of the corporate lapses that have, that, that have happened. You know, we've seen quite a few failures in companies. Uh, and then when you drill down, you can definitely see some corporate governance uh, issues there, but it's, uh, are we, you know, um, actually documenting these so that they can present a case study for future firms or entrepreneurs to learn from not to make the same mistakes. Um, but overall, generally, um, you know, with the sustainable banking principle, you know, we believe it's a good step, uh, given that, you know, the banks are essentially a, um, you know, they play a big role in society uh, in terms of, you know, providing access to finance. Um, so therefore, you know, they definitely uh, can in a, in impact good practices should they choose to within their lending criteria. So one way to do that, you know, is ensuring that you know the the clients that they they serve, uh, they can also ensure how they can you know be positively influencing these uh, clients through uh, helping them manage their corporate governance practices and which overall. If they do that, you know, would also limit the bank's exposure to, you know, any reputational or legal exposures. But yeah, so it's, it's a win-win for both. I think where, you know, the, it's uh, so, so society's role and to support, uh, you know, the, the good practices. At the same time, institutions also then have to make sure they implement those practices once they're instilled. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So. Now, this one goes as more of a, an open question, so both of you could still make inputs. What do you think is the relationship between having a functioning board and a functioning firm or bank? And do you think there's a relationship crosses? I've had the incidents of speaking to persons, and then um, you hear things like, oh, uh, we are a small business. It's not for us. Oh, we are not a bank. It's, it's not for us. Um, are you able to expound a bit on the relationship between a functioning board? And of course, the second bit is whether when you have a functioning board, does it really affect your sustainability, your long-term survival? Is that something that you'd want to add for our audience? Okay. So okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, should we raise our hands? <laughs> Okay, um, Dr. Fiado, I, I really think that if we look at the links between a functioning 
board and the functioning bank. Um, the functioning board is an, uh, an antecedent to a functioning organization. Doesn't even matter where, uh, what type of organization. If you have a functioning board, it will be presumed that the organization will also function. And I would like to add the word good. So not only whether it's functioning, you know, is alive and running, but a good functioning board will is supposed to equal to a good functioning um, organization. And I'm sure that if we look in our industry and what has happened here, uh, you would find out that we have internal, uh, the internationalization of organizations that are in operating within the uh, country uh, that seem to have more rigorous corporate governance structures have been able to survive. Uh, and uh, the brunt of what has happened has affected most of our local uh, uh, banks. And so the question therefore from there is like, okay, so are the boards, the human beings that were are put on the boards, yes, they have them, they all have them. Do they attend meetings? Absolutely. Are they effective? We can see the results. And that is where um, I think that a lot of the, the, the thoughts around ensuring that we have effective boards who understand the goals of the organization and the level of diversity that is required as you did said in your presentation um, is key to ensuring that the organization's management ha has the ability to provide the necessary information for decision making uh, to these boards. Now their clients on the other hand, of course, if the clients, if you have a, a board and it's not functioning well and your bank is not going to function well, then there's going to be a domino effect. And I believe that is what we have experienced, uh, the domino effect between the uh, 2018, 2018 and 2019. And uh, hopefully right now, um, our central bank has definitely put in all the, uh, uh, most of the structures to support in the um, of most of the banks. And I think it's ongoing and the bar is going to definitely continue to be raised uh, by the central bank. Thank you. Mohammed, would you want to say something to that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And, and also, apologies for not having my camera on. It's just I'm getting a low bandwidth uh, message, so <laughs> so that's why it's off. But I thought I'd put it on for a second, so you know, put the name, the face of the name, as they say. Um, yeah. So I think to answer your question, uh, definitely, I believe there is a direct relationship or correlation um, between a functioning board and uh, a functioning uh, firm, per se. Uh, in, in the sense that uh, you know the the role of the board essentially is to provide you know a, a mechanism that would uh, control and direct a business or a company, um, and that board plays a supervisory supervisory role as you mentioned in your presentation. They have the oversight and control, and strategic advice, strategic guidance and advice. Um, so to do that, you know, and they need to evaluate. The managers analyze uh, whether inputs are used efficiently and so forth. Um, so there have been many theories put forward that have highlighted the significance of the board, um, you know, in solving different organizational problems. And uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, if you look back to most of the corporate governance or corporate failures, even though most of the big ones are in financial services, so you know the uh, the 2018. Um, 
you know, sorry, in 2012, sorry, financial crisis. And I believe Ghana also had a financial crisis. Uh, you know, we tend to see that, uh, you know, corporate governance weaknesses in, in those institutions were ultimately the cause of, uh, you know, the fall in, in those companies. Um, so therefore, yeah, so, you know, it is important that, uh, you know, a functioning board uh, would ultimately result in a functioning company. And as Ms. Brown said, uh, you know, a good, the good is operative word there uh, because uh, a corporate governance system should um, have a proper incentive for both the board and management to be able to pursue uh, the objectives that are in line with the interests of the business and the shareholders, right? Which ultimately would impact the performance. So the performance would be either on the financial aspects, looking at the, uh, you know, return on equity, or whether it's a social um, impact the organization um, is performing socially. Um, so yes, I believe uh, you know this uh, is a good f the corporate governance is a good foundation for business success. Um, and as I again mentioned previously, you know, what, what we've seen is that, uh, you know, I think you mentioned too, it doesn't have to be that you have to be a big corporate for you to be able to start implementing corporate governance. Um, I, you know, if you look at uh, businesses in general, what we tend to see in terms of, sort of survival, the ones to have good uh, structures survive, especially for SMEs where, you know, they usually face a key man risk where, that one person is in charge of, you know, everything, uh, you know, business could be operating, you know, they have everything in their head with no structures and mm -hmm. something happens down the line, whether it's an illness or, you know, uh, an absence, you know, and everything is, uh, goes down the drain because of the absence of uh, a governance structure. So this is where, you know, should they have had a board, whether it be a corporate or an advisory board, in such instance that you know they can still be around to support that transition period if there's a void. So essentially, yeah. So I think there there is a definitely a link in terms of the functioning board and functioning firm or bank. Let me hold let me hold you there for a moment. Um, Kesua mentioned the issue of having a board on paper and mm -hmm. then um, another. So can you comment briefly? What do you think is the difference or what can you tell us about the difference between having a board and having a functioning or what we call an effective board? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah. So you're right. Uh, you would see that, yeah, some people would have boards just to tick a box, uh, whether it's to meet a compliance requirement or it's to, you know, get that financing, access, you know, from the bank uh, or so forth, uh, you know, as a part of, you know, the requirements. Um, but yet, when you look at the, the board itself, uh, you know, they, they actually did not de uh, deliver what they're supposed to deliver. Um, so, you know, I think if you look at that uh, chart you presented, where you had the different types of board varying from low involvement to high involvement. Um, the paper board, yeah, it would generally just um, be there as, you know, nice to have per se. Um, and uh, in terms of functionality then, you know, they, would, they wouldn't necessarily be engaged on the day to day. You would still find the CEO perhaps be driving most of the decision um, and the board would just come in to, you know, sort of uh, give the pass so that things can get through. So that is not what you want. That's not a functioning or an effective board. Um, effective board, essentially, you know, you have to have key uh, dynamics in terms of the board structure and the composition, where you're looking at ensuring you have the right skill mix, diversity, um, you know, do the directors uh, understand their duties in terms of their role, their role of management, right? As you mentioned, you know, uh, basically, they keep their nose in, but their hands out, so not on, in terms of day to day. Mm -hmm. And the board function um, does the board really chat, uh, have discussions, candid discussion in terms of the firm performance and how to steer the ship forward? Because uh, that, that, that is what they're there for, right? To fill in those gaps in the management and provide that strategic um, oversight. Um, so, yeah, so there's definitely uh, uh, a, a difference between a paper board and uh, a functioning board and those are some of the characteristics that would uh you know that would that you can see there where 
one, you know, one is very, you know, uh, re results oriented uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, and structured in terms of meetings and so forth. And the other one would be just ad hoc coming in when needed. And then that's it. And then maybe, you know, no engagement at all, no, no processes, no structures, which is not what you want uh, in a, in a, in a board. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Dr. Yeah. Barrett, we have lots of questions, lots of hands raised. So just let me know how you want to manage it. Um, if you want me to read questions or comments, call on people. Yeah. So we, we'll take one, one, um, one last round from the panelists and then the questions should flow in. So the issue is, of course, they talked about the effective board. And once you want to talk about an effective board, then it means that there's some kind of assessment or benchmark you're supposed to work in. So my thinking, what do you think of board assessments? How often should it run? And uh, how, should it be, how should it be rolled out? So we can start with Mohammed, and then we'll wrap up with Keswe, and then the questions will take over from there. Uh, OK. Just brief ones. Okay, sure. No, no, no problem. Yeah. So um, board assessments are a very uh, key or very important in terms of uh, in understanding the board's uh, effectiveness. Uh, you know, actually, that's one way to assess whether your your board is a functioning board or a, a, a paper board, uh, as we had mentioned earlier. Um, you know, the idea that is that the assessments essentially are there to provide uh, you know, a sense of um, review of the board itself, uh, whether, you know, they're performing in terms of their structure, in terms of their goals and objectives, and also just to them to identify areas that need Im improvement. Um, so, and also prepares the board to be ready for the future, right? So the assessments can reveal which issues the directors think need more attention um, and, and so, so forth. So therefore it's a very um, important exercise um, to be able to um, assess themselves, um, which can be done, you know, usually can either through a third party uh, or internally through the establishments, perhaps uh, an renumeration committee that can do that for, for them. Um, but also some boards will do also what we call a, a peer review where you have, uh, you know, they actually evaluate each other in, in terms of seeing how they're performing, right? So if you're looking at the board, the full board in general, uh, you'd want to evaluate um, in performance in terms of uh, whether they're delivering value to the management. Uh, you can also review the committees within the board to see whether they are actually uh, providing the oversight functions it's supposed to provide in line with the charter of the board. And then you can look at the individual director's performance too, to see whether what value they bring. Um, for example, in state of enterprises, you know, what we've seen is that because most of them are appointed, you know, you, you find that in, in a way there's a bit of, um, you know, laxity in terms of uh, e effectiveness. So, you know, when you assess your individual directors, you know, you give them that motivation to show that, you know, I have to show up and perform and to deliver to my peers here. So those are some of the, the things that you can do. And uh, you know, the structures can be either through a questionnaire, uh, discussions, and uh, once you finish that, then you, know, you have to make sure you give back the, the answers to the board so they can develop an action plan to see you know, where they're doing well, not doing well, and uh, how they can improve going forward. Thank you. Ms. Brown, you want to say something for us to be wrapping up then? Let me read the questions. Okay, um, I think that um, with this question, it's, it's uh, important to understand uh, why boards do not uh, choose to assess themselves. And I think PwC did a, a report and came out with the results. And I, I, the, the results actually resonate. Uh, the first thing that they said was that they were talking about uh, our board doesn't feel uh, that is appropriate to evaluate the performance of individuals, which is what has been touched on the board itself, committees, and then the individuals. So, you know, if, if we look at the makeup of the board, 
uh, are they, do they really feel that they can evaluate others when they themselves may not necessarily be uh, the, the best role models? Secondly, it, it found that board members are reluctant to be evaluated. Obviously, we, we probably know why. Then, um, of course, the external reason they say is uh, it's too time intensive. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that they, they have this, of course, but I was also expecting them to say probably it's too costly. Then the other thing was that other potential negative impact on the board collegiality is something that they have also used as an excuse. And then our existing process uh, is sufficient. So, so we, if we take these sample excuses that uh, we currently have, uh, that, and the reason why boards don't get assessed uh, at the end of the day, uh, it is as we are making uh, individuals on boards more aware, and as we are forming um, more rigorous processes, particularly with the chairman and their uh, independent uh, um, members, I think that the journey has started and it, it should continue. Uh, if it's at a slow pace, we, we will get there. Uh, I don't think that board assessments uh, for local institutions uh, is uh, embedded, but I believe that once the international organizations have started, uh, it, it will get to a point where the regulators who have actually requested it, people will have no choice but to do that. When we do that, then uh, we, uh, we hope that it will also improve the uh, standard of membership of the boards. That one of the banking uh, challenges now, uh, based on the frameworks that have been delivered is that right now it's tough finding the, the right people. Um, people are actually declining uh, the, the, uh, to be on boards because there's a lot of compliance uh, requirements uh, that individuals have to ensure that they comply with. So we'll get there, we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Okay, so Demi, the floor is open now. You may read the questions and I believe the panelists will take them up. If there are specific ones for them, I'm sure you could direct Sure. sure. So let me start with the comments and then I'll go over to the questions. So Francis had said that a proper functioning board is also um, predicated on the culture and conduct of key actors in the governance space, especially at the helm of the organization. Thank you for that um, comment. Um, then I have another comment um, from Sarah Boateng. She says, my issue is how we can get businesses, business on board to incorporate ESG in their governance structure and ensuring compliance. Um, so I think that's a comment and maybe we can also turn that into a question. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Barbara says, I see that we have corporate governance principles and guidelines, not codes. Seemingly it is the SEC that has a code that will be out, that will be outdoored soon. It's very important that we have codes. So that's um, Barbara speaking to the need for codes. Um, that's a comment, but I think you know some of these questions. If any of the of um, the panelists want to to answer, and then Francis again had earlier said while um, um, Ms. Brown was speaking, he said that in response to Kesawa's comments, my take is that we also need strong enforcement mechanisms in the regulatory space. All regulators, not specifically Bank of Ghana alone. Okay. So I'm going to now move over to the questions. Um, Bamba, I know Bamba had had her hand raised earlier. I see her question also here. Bamba, would you like to um, unmute yourself and, and um, give your, your question? Okay, so let me just um, say, let me read Bamba's question how to implement ESG when executive directors are not implicated? Can I have best practices? So that's um, one question. Um, um, then 
um, Barbara also had a question. So let me read the questions and then um, the second question is the question regarding the new company code in Ghana, how sufficiently has corporate governance been catered for? So let me pause there and um, just based on those two questions on how sufficiently has corporate governance been catered for with the new company code in Ghana and the question around what are the best practices um, for directors? Um, let me pass it over to the panelists now. Oh, thank you. All right, so let me attempt uh, something. Now, in terms of the um, issue of executive directors, how to implement it when they, they are not implicated, I believe, um, I'm sure the HR aspects would also help with that, but it normally comes out with the kind of performance contracts that are drawn up and the implications for performance or non-performance. So if per season there is a revision of performance contracts and you embed these mandates in them, it means that at the end of the period when you are assessing performance and they have failed to meet those requirements, then of course the question is whether we are to renew the contracts or not. So I think that becomes a blend in terms of performance contracts and policies as the case may be. So yes, external persons, which then rolls into the corporate um, companies, the new companies code, or the company act in this case. Um, it's partially, but it's not fully, it's not been that extensively addressed. So it still leaves a bit of room for um, some of these things that have already been going on to continue to be. But I believe the awareness and the upheavals in the financial services industry and others, in a sense, would provide a cue as to the fact that having a board is not, as they say, not a paper board case, but rather should be more functioning board. So in and of itself, a code doesn't really go out there to explicitly say what you must have and what you mustn't have. That is captured under the Corporate Governance Directive and the Fit for Purpose that was rolled out by BOG. But for the company's code in and of itself, it does not explicitly say but of course, there's room for improvement. I believe that may come up with further amendments as the time goes on. I believe my other panelists would want to say something. Um, so, so I'll contribute to, there was a company called, um, they improved it by prescribing uh, certain things for certain roles and what thing uh, and you know tenure and all that stuff but because company code expands beyond the banking industry uh, it's for all organizations i think that their key um aim was to ensure that the weaknesses that they had identified in the old code would be uh, taken care of in the new code uh, to improve the governance of uh, most of the organization. It's a, a document that, of course, as we roll out, uh, they will identify other key issues. And I think it's an ongoing uh, document that will be revised and amended as we go forward. What they have done right now uh, gives a, a clarity to certain roles, even including the company secretary. Um, that is for the board. They actually prescribe what the, 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 the education background and all of those things uh, for uh, the company secretaries, which is much better than the, uh, before where people will probably just uh, take certain individuals and um, put them in the roles without the necessary um, educational background or experience they require so so for me that that's it's an improvement and we hope that it will continue yeah yeah and uh just to add uh to the question on making uh directors you know more i guess uh responsive i think the question was whether they cannot be implicated um i think uh yeah it's actually uh well, sometimes directors, you know, do not understand that they actually have a fiduciary role to play um, being, when serving on, on the board. You know, it's not just the title of I'm, I'm, I'm a board member, um, but they actually do have, um, you know, duties to discharge uh, in terms of uh, duties, 
of care and you know and also lo loyalty so by care meaning you know are they doing the duties in good faith uh that can be in the best interest of the company and loyalty you know putting the company interest first so essentially you know even though uh so the the point i'm making there is that di directors are you know actually responsible for the what, what happens in a in, in a company uh and can be held li liable so it's important that you know the board uh you know in terms of being effective you know actually instills this into the directors to make them know that you know you're not just here to you know sit on, on on the board but we do expect you to be able to perform uh because if anything does happen you know legally they could go i, I believe it's two years or so uh, down the line to see you know who's serving those level of authority uh, at that time so therefore yeah so in as an executive director your role definitely that's one way to make sure that you know uh, you can you know, get them to perform their best if they do know that they, they, they can be repercussions for bad decisions being made during their tenureship and just and just to um, add to that uh, I mentioned earlier on that uh, we're finding it very difficult to find <laughs> directors of, or identify uh, good directors for some of our boards for the banks because the liabilities have been spelled out, they have been um, communicated, and so uh, they are not easy. <laughs> the liability that is out there to be a board member is not easy at all. And thus, before people accept uh, to be members of a board, they have to clearly uh, know what they are getting into for now, particularly in our industry. Any more questions? Thank you for that. Um, let me call on, we have some people that have had their hands raised. If this was a physical hand raising, they would be very tired. <laughs> so let me start with Divine. Um, Divine, do you want to unmute yourself and um, ask a question? Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is on looking at our cultural practices and relationships. Do we truly have independent <laughs> net in Ghana? <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. Then is it is it um is it good to have a single board or a dual board? Thank you. Actually, you want to start or actually start? <laughs> okay, let me start. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, we have a very interesting uh, network in terms of bloodlines and familiar relationships when it comes to gun. But if you want to stretch the meaning of independent net, independence usually means independence of mind and uh, behavior. So um, yes, of course, the closer you are in terms of blood relations, the independence is a bit of a problem. But Independence in terms of mind and thought are things that could still be attained when you, you could still be dealing with friends and other relations. So yes, it is possible to have. The independence has to do with, in terms of, so you don't have conflicts of interest relations with organization, you're not related to the organization in any way. And uh, once that independence is attained, I believe we're going to have our own uh, version of the independent net because if you go to places like japan that they have a lot of cross networks but they, they seem to have relatively good governance on some of the issues at least they've got firms that live and outlive the owners in first and second generations to go so i think that as we expound on it and we implement we adopt we are likely to get a relatively a uh, polished version of what really works for us in Africa, since we, we, we marry across bloodlines and whatnot, we'll definitely yes, find our, our own portion of uh, the independent. May we go to that. I think I've put. Okay, me, okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, 
Any other comments or, or I'll call um, Quadro to, to make his own contribution or question. I, I was going to say that in addition to Dr. Fiador's comments, um, where she's clearly talked about independence of mind and uh, behavior, I was actually laughing because I was just thinking about what has just happened uh, in the news that we are all fully aware of. But the bottom line is that there are certain characteristics of the individuals who are supposed to be members. And the key characteristics, if we talk about their integrity, uh, their dedication, effectiveness, you know, uh, their competence. I mean, this is talking about a good functioning board. And one of the things that the individuals should have is passion and diligence for the organization, meaning that they should have an interest in the survival of the organization. I believe we do have uh, individuals who, who can, I mean, do that. And they are doing it because not all organizations are failing. We have international organizations. They are, full, I mean, the, the, the people working there are Ghanaians. The leadership is Ghanaian, they are made up of, up of Ghanaians. So it, it can happen. The, it is, for me, I think the key is in the individuals who are selected and nominated to be on the boards. And you'll find that some of the individuals where they feel challenged or they cannot have that independent of mind, they do what just happened yesterday. They leave the boards. It happens all the time. Uh, and so, yes, we, we have a challenge with the overlap of our culture, but I do believe that some, uh, most of our senior people, or uh, maybe even junior, they, 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 they still go by the uh, good name is better than riches, which is what um, we used to talk about long time ago. I don't know if it's still <laughs> applicable, but I think that, we have that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Okay, so um, um, okay, so I, I see two hands now, um, Quadro and um, um, Dr. Welbeck. Dr. Welbeck, I won't read your comments um, so that because you raised your hand. Um, we had some other um, questions and comments, so I'll read all of them and then I'll call on Quadro and then the, um, the panelists can all speak. Um, Faisal said, what gets measured or checked is what actually gets done. This underscores the central role of regulatory authorities who must play their supervisory role. Um, so Dr. Welbeck, as you're speaking, please speak to that too. <laughs> um, and then uh, Augustine says, from the discussions and what I observed in the environment, corporate governance looks more like a privilege rather than a necessity for businesses. How do we make it a necessity? Is it, um, I think um, Augustine must be in academia because she then gives us multiple choice questions. Is it an issue of the A, value they add, B, missed value, or C, value cost issue? So Dr. Vera, please just put on your academic hat and, and answer that one. Um, Lauren says, how, will, how well have we examined the performance of board taking into consideration? Into, I think I already read this comment. Uh, but I'll just read it again. How well have we examined the performance of board taking into consideration, uh, taking into consideration the cultural and environmental perspective? I think I read that already. Okay, so please note these um, questions and comments, and then I'll call on Quadro to also speak. Okay, so let's academically answer this. Okay, so um, I think the issue from Augustine's uh, point has to do with the fact that yes, like I mentioned in my presentation, majority of our businesses think that corporate governance is just a, a nice to have as opposed to a must have. Now, um, I believe the only way to let them understand is the fact that yeah, all the points you raised here are actually angles from which we can push the agenda for corporate governance integration. Because yes, corporate, a good functioning, a good and functional board does add value. It creates value because of course they begin to question, they begin to make impartial decisions, they make decisions that add value to the organization. And yes, without a functioning board or a good functioning board, you do miss out on significant value. If for nothing and they are not even adding on the fact that they can keep certain things at bay for you, 
and even give you a sounding board for you to discuss issues. That's actually something you miss out in. So you, you make more optimal decisions when you've got a good and functional board. And then of course the value cost issue, yes. So there's, you, there's a cost implication as well, because if like we're looking at the case of the rollout of the sustainable banking, and given that banks are the predominant suppliers of credit for the purpose of business expansion, then not having a good board in place because you're going to look beyond the paper board issue and look at a functional and effective board. Then of course there are cost implications for not having. And maybe once you begin to make these issues very clear to the um, businesses out there and all the stakeholders within our business community and the ecosystem, it might very well play a role to make it more of a necessity not that a necessity because someone is holding a gun to your head, but the fact that you lose value when you don't and you miss out on value when you don't and you actually have cost implications because without a good board, then it means your cost of capital is high. So you may want to actually think of getting a good one so you can reduce your cost of capital. I want to believe I, I helped to academically answer it if I did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think, um, um, Quadro, please um, go ahead with your, with your comment. Okay, um, Dami, thank you very much. And then um, let me say thank you to all the, um, Dr. Dr. Fiado especially for the good presentation. Um, you know, the traditional, um, if I use, can use the word traditional board, is actually concerned with the, 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 the bottom line of, of the business. And I think somebody or, already raised that, uh, sent you a question or a comment, uh, you know, similar to what I'm going to say uh, or ask. How has the experience been, you know, uh, getting the uh, existing board? Is there, is there, is, are there any um, uh, um, experiences to share with us? You know, how's, how the experience has been? Uh, with you know ensuring that the existing board actually imbibe the environmental and social uh, aspects of their operation, and if there are not, what 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 programs are going to be put in place to 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 make sure that the the, the, uh -huh. the boards and maybe boards to be formed, you know, actually uh, are aware of the environmental and social uh, aspects of their of their responsibilities. Thank you. Okay. okay, okay. Do you want me to, but Dr. Fiado, you want me to make a comment on that question? Yeah, yeah I'll, 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 that's what I was going to, to tell him. Uh, so, Kojo, uh, the um, all boards are supposed to be looking at, of course the profitability so that the shareholders can enjoy some dividends. But their, their key thing is for them to, as they are looking at the profitability, they are so, also keep the organization alive. And that's where we get, the, uh, we get a little bit confused. And in keeping the board alive, meaning that we have to make sure that the whatever we do, it will sustain the, the, the bloodline of the organization. So in 2008, the central bank gave National Bank and College a mandate uh, to support in the education of corporate governance. And so we started an annual certification program for all directors. And so um, we've done the 2019 and 2020, we actually have a sustainable banking practice, the role of the board, um, being delivered as a course. But coming back to your question and wondering how does it fit in, obviously banks are big organizations, but where it fits in is the relationship between uh, the, the, the purpose of a bank. The purpose of a bank is to grow assets. That means that they have to lend to the uh, clients and for the clients to be able to borrow, we need to just make sure that the, those sustainable uh, principles are affected in the organization. So if you look, uh, a practical example is if you look at the mining organization. Mining organizations, they need a lot of capital or they need a lot of credit. 
And so if you are an organization, a bank, and you're going to give out a big loan, you should definitely make sure that the mining organization that you are giving out the loan to is actually meeting the sustainable uh, principles. And if they are not, and you lend to them, there, there's a risk or well, several risks. Number one, the risk of that organization uh, dying uh, because they've done something wrong. Now, then there's a risk of the, the death of that organization being attributed to you as a bank um, providing the money and therefore you have a rep reputational risk. And therefore you find other organizations not wanting to do business with you um, and, and, and so forth and so on. So the uh, banking uh, institutions definitely need to ensure that whoever they are doing business with, they need to now pay attention uh, to the environmental and social framework and the impact of, of the, the principles on the businesses so that they don't get branded. Because I think if you saw what uh, Madame F uh, Fiador, Dr. Fiador mentioned, we look, there were three areas, branding, right? You don't want to get branded. And eventually you realize that your cost will go down. If you get uh, branded or you get into a reputational um, risk issue, you have to, you get legal costs. You have to think about that. Um, if people know that you are giving um, loans to actually companies that are doing well or have a good social impact on the environment, well, good social impact on the people, your good environmental um, impact on the country, um, people want to do business with you. I'll use a Zoom Lion as an example. What are they doing? They are working in the waste area. But what you don't know is that Zoom Lion has <laughs> the whole of West Africa. They can go there and do more business and become a, even a more bigger uh, organization. So that's the practical sense that I wanted to mention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, I'm very mindful of time. I know we're um, eight minutes over already. Um, I wanted to just um, take one more comment. Um, I don't know if um, Dr. Welbeck, you had your hand up. You still want to make a comment? Dami, I thought you were reading my comment, so you saved time. So it was just a general comment. Okay. All right. So the comments Dr. Welbeck had had, let me read it, is, um, let me find it. Sorry, I have to scroll up. Um, Dr. Welbeck, I can't find it. Can you please just uh, quickly give the comments? <laughs> I was just trying to allude to the fact that moral aptitude, integrity, and probity are very core values that directly correlate to corporate governance. Mm -hmm. And my experience is that that, even though it's written in most documents, is difficult to measure. As such, we continue to look at the qualitative issue, board assessment, board uh, CO duality, and all those things that are actually qualitative, qualitative scores that it's difficult to do, but the qualitative aspect, which talks about the moral aptitude, is that we would have to see how we can assess payment. And that is, I think, very core to corporate government because it's a moral issue and it starts from the fabrics of society. So I think that doing all these things, we need to really look at the human being. And I'm sure very appreciate what I'm saying. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Welbeck. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, um, so I'm not going to be able to take any more comments or questions. I think as a roundup, um, uh, Mina had a very great question, which I think is a perfect roundup. Um, and um, uh, Ms. Ms. Brown, I think you've already answered it, but um, maybe you can just kind of um, give the general information to everyone. But uh, Mina had asked around how is the National Banking College um, helping to achieve the sustainable banking principles three. I'm, I'm going to extend that question a little bit to everyone, um, um, to Kesoa, to Rivera, and to Mohammed, just talking about how in um, the different um, um, organizations you're working with, how are you going to be supporting going forward the adoption of the sustainable banking principles, both principle three and in, in general? Okay, so thank you. Um, 
so like I stated, well, we now have the, uh, the annual certification program uh, that uh, we actually deliver to all our members, uh, 23 universal banks. We also look at the savings and loans and um, the finance houses. And this, we try to take topical issues. We started in 2019 and we went from the beginning to, to all the liability explained the code that was uh, Act 930 that has uh, Bank of Ghana has actually put out there. They need to understand what it means. They need to understand their liabilities as uh, individual members. Uh, we talked about the uh, reporting. And so now we are actually going to go to the second level uh, that is the ESCO who are not directors and then um, also deal with the uh, human resource team because human resource, we, we, we never think about them, but they are the ones who bring people in. And, and, and if the quality that are brought in do not meet the standards, uh, then you, you have a problem for a long time because our labor laws are really, really stringent, very difficult to, to get rid of people. Uh, so that's what we are doing for now. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so just picking up on where you left off on regulations. Um, so indeed, uh, I mean, you know, we understand that, uh, you know, creating, you know, a good corporate governance system generally involves, you know, changing the nation's, you know, corporate governance uh, regulations and, and so forth. So what we at IFC are doing in addition to working with institutions, but we also working with regulators uh, in developing codes, um, you know, that can, you know, be used as a benchmark to, you know, make it uh, more of a requirement for institutions to be able to practice corporate governance, not just big corporations, but all the way down to the SMEs them, themselves, uh, you know, as a way to get that going. And additionally, uh, you know, just doing more awareness, uh, because it is a behavioral uh, we know this, well, I guess it's a progression actually. So at different stages of a business or institution, uh, there's different uh, levels of corporate governance requirements that they'll be practicing uh, because of the time it takes, the cost it takes. So you, you, you don't want, you know, they, they say you have to walk before you can run. So there's definitely a, pro a progression matrix where we work with uh, firms, for example, to know where they're at in their business cycle. Are you a startup? Are you a growing firm, uh, you know, and then based on that, then you can see where, what type of governance practices you should have in place for you to be able to then get to the next level. Because ultimately, as I mentioned, again, the key here is, uh, you know, awareness and be, uh, behavior. So, you know, and as much as, you know, we we know it's good to do, but in, in practice, it's, it's hard to do. So it's just keeping that constant um, training. So when boards are being, constituted ensuring you have the proper induction for the members to all be aware of their requirements and so forth um, and reaching out to institutions like so I know in Ghana we worked with the Institute of Directors also uh, in terms of and in Sierra Leone we worked with the women on boards trying to create more uh, diversity for women to get onto boards so those are the things ISC has been doing uh, just to uh, you know make sure that we're touching all points to get the word out there that corporate governance, you know, does add value and can, you know, ultimately benefit firm and society in general. Okay, so yeah, thanks. Um, in terms of how we're helping out uh, both other business school and myself and my capacity as the principal consultant for my firm, Madiolo Consult, what we've tried to do is to make ourselves available as much as possible to provide training because then um, as one book I read says, if you want to get someone to learn a certain behavior, give them a tool to use. And I think it's linked to a comment that one person raised here about the fact that what will the trainings do? Would our certification for directors help or we should maybe create a board performance index? I believe that is soon in the often because as board assessments are taking you know, food stage or center stage, we'll come to the point where um, even as the banks are also rolling out their corporate governance or sustainability framework, 
it will come to a point where a board must fulfill a certain threshold or have certain characteristics which we will likely be rated and graded and with time we're going to move towards that. But in general, like um, Mohammed said, the issue is about training, awareness. When we sound the gong long enough, at least those who are genuinely, um, you know, leaning towards best practices, et cetera, would want to take it up and then we'll be left to the ones that may need a bit more of a push and a show to get things running. So in general, it's about creating awareness, being ready to take on for training purposes. So any firm that needs to want to, you know, help, get help in terms of implementing sustainable banking in and of itself, integrating environmental and social risk management into their framework, are free to call on the IFC to link them to the consultants that they have trained so that it becomes a walkthrough and an easy frame to implement. So that's what I've got to say by way of how we are helping to integrate. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Vera. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you to everyone for joining. Um, the We had a very um, um, interactive session, lots of comments and lots of questions. Um, again, just to let you know that if you can um, please reach out, um, we will be sharing um, the presentations. If you registered, we have your email address and we will be sharing the presentation and the slides with you. Um, please take um, 60 seconds, actually 30 seconds to fill out the evaluation I just posted on. It will take you no longer than 30 seconds, I promise you. It's literally just three questions. Um, and we are excited to continue to host um, our different consultants around the sustainable banking principles. So we'll keep you on our database and we'll continue to share um, information about um, opportunities to learn about sustainable banking, um, whether it's about ENS risk management, um, financial inclusion, um, um, footprinting, environmental footprinting, green finance and such. So please um, stay tuned for more information about other sessions. Um, and with that, let me just say again, say a big thank you to our panelists and thank you to everyone for joining. And I wish you a very productive rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was a good presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ver. Thank you very <laughs> much. Ms. Brown, and Dami, thank you. Okay, so Dami, you're in charge. You can close us. Okay, I'm going to end it now. Thank you, everyone. All right, bye. Bye.